going to take a look and <clears throat> have a talk tonight. I think it'll be a talk, just a talk. You, you know, the Word of God hits you in different ways, and some things you get real passionate about, and, and other things are just as important. You're just as excited about them, but it just kind of comes off maybe like a Sunday school lesson or a lecture or something. Um, so let's see how this goes. In John 17, as God the Son is praying to God the Father, and we're going to look at joy. Joy, something that we talk about a lot as Christians. However, we don't look at this source of joy in this way very often. But let's see what, what happens here as we get into verse 13. Jesus says, Jesus prays, And now... Come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus has a joy-filled life. Jesus is joy. We read here in this short verse as our text that we share in His joy. That can't be anything better than the joy of Jesus. Some people max out at pleasure in this world. Some people live for pleasure. That that people seek pleasure. They they hope that their pleasure will be a counter to their burdens and the sorrows and the care that they face and and some people put put all their focus in any category like this by by way of pleasure. And and as I mentioned, pleasure, pleasure is a pleasurable word. It's, there's nothing wrong with pleasure in and of itself. We, we like to have some pleasure, pleasure time. The Christmas party at Brother Rick's house, it was, it was a time we gathered together and we had some pleasure. And it was refreshing. And it's good to have a laugh. And it's good to hang out and... Nobody's expecting a devotion from Brother Kenneth or a sermon where they're laughing and joking and, and having some fun. It, it was, there was some pleasure there. And that's okay. It was good. It hit the spot. But there is something so much higher that gives so much greater an effect than pleasure does. Pleasure's okay. You know, it has its time. But it's not all the time. There's something more than that, okay? We, we can take a step up and, and talk about happiness. And, and I've said and I've heard in preaching that, that God's not trying to make us happy. He's trying to make us holy. And that is absolutely true. I've preached that. I, I said, I've said that, you know. But, but, but there's a spiritual happiness we might speak of. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, there are those Beatitudes, and it says, blessed are ye, or, uh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. And it, and it uses the word blessed there about nine times in a row. And, and you look that up, and, and it means happy are you. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spiritual happiness that is being spoken of there. But there is still something that far exceeds happiness, and that is joy. The joy of Jesus. I tell you what, if, if we're putting all of this on pleasure, man, we're aiming low if we just want to have pleasure in life. Pleasure stops at personal satisfaction. That's where it maxes out. That, that's all you get. That's as far as you get. Personal satisfaction. Happiness is aiming higher. 
Someone likened happiness to a, to a still lake. You know, when the lake is very still, mirror image, you, you don't plan on that thing going beyond the boundaries and, and overflowing. But when you think about a river, a river can overflow. And someone liked an overflowing river to joy, to the joy of Jesus. So pleasure doesn't go beyond self. A lake doesn't go beyond its banks. But joy is overflowing. We talk about joy a lot. I think people like the thought of having joy. It's, you know, I've, I've grown to like the command to rejoice always. Not, not that I always do it as I should. We fall short of that. But just to know that God tells us to rejoice always means we can. I, so I, I like that. When we think of Jesus, you know, he spoke of his character some. I am meek and lowly in heart. We think of Jesus walking this earth. We, we read the Gospels and we meditate on the Gospels and, and we picture Jesus. We picture him sitting there at the well when the woman at the well comes up. The disciples go off to, to eat meat. We, you know, we just we picture the life of Jesus and, and we, we think about his characteristics and things of that nature. Do we think of Jesus as joyful? Now, now we know that He is, but, but do we picture that in His character? Jesus being joyful. Jesus is, is everything good, and we think about a lot of things. Do we think about Him being joyful? I, I know we don't think about Him being bitter, or something like that. But I don't know. Somebody tell me after service if I'm wrong. Or concerning you personally. Or you can tell me now if you want. But I don't think we, we picture Jesus as, as being joyful. I, I, I don't think that's something we think of. I don't hear anyone say anything about that. Maybe, maybe nobody rejects that. So maybe it's this. Maybe we think of, of Jesus as having joy to give. That's how we connect Jesus with joy. He gives us joy. But what about Jesus being joyful? Do we think about him and joy as, as joy being something he has and not something that he is? Did Jesus have joy to give everyone, but he just moped around himself with a long face? I mean, really, think about it. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Jesus was humiliated over and over. As he walked this earth. The Bible says, records his words. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Is what it says in reference to Jesus. But here in the text. And in other places, Jesus talks about. His joy. Here he says, my joy. How do we explain this sorrowful Savior as joyful? You know, the, we want to know more about Jesus. We want to learn more about Jesus. We want to learn more about what we're talking about and thinking about concerning our Lord and Savior tonight. Read and study the Gospels. And study the life of Jesus. And something that we would find as we go through the Gospels, we know that it, it comes to the cross and Jesus going to the cross in the latter part of the Gospels. 
And it's there, closer to the cross, that Jesus talks about joy. He talks about joy more than His joy than He does early, earlier in His ministry. In His final instructions, as He looked to encourage and comfort the disciples, we find Him speaking of joy. As darkness was coming on, and Jesus was going to the cross, and sorrow was starting to rise, so was joy. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Jesus was bearing our sin burden when He went to the cross. He was taking upon Himself our sorrow. He, he wasn't joyful over the pain and over the mutilation and the, and the piercing in the, in the side and, and the piercing He took on the cross. He wasn't joyful over that. But He was joyful that He was able to take our suffering and our pain upon Himself. He took our suffering from sin away from us, and He put it on Himself. Jesus was acceptable, and Jesus was able to be our sacrifice for sin. And that gave Him joy. Okay? Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. I'm going to go to that verse a time or two here for a few minutes on this. Jesus came down from heaven and extracted our guilt and took the pain and took the punishment upon Himself as a man on the cross. He, he took the heavy weight of all that was weighing the world down, weighing all humanity down upon Him. He died, He was buried. God raised Him. God was satisfied with what He supplied in substitution for you and I. And this is Jesus' joy. We are Jesus' joy. When He died on the cross, when He went to that cross for us, He knew that souls could come to God freely to be saved from their sins. And that God used His Son to supply it. This, was, this is the joy of the Lord. Suffering, but not, it's not suffering alone. Suffering in our place. Suffering for us. Suffering for us so that we can go free. Suffering to save us. Jesus will save anyone who will believe on Him as their Lord and Savior to forgive them for their sins. If if a person realizes they're a sinner, which everyone is, and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and believe on Him, trust in Him for everlasting life by faith, He will save them. This is, this is the joy of Jesus, that He could supply that for us. We, we might consider other something else, though it overlaps with this joy of Jesus. 
and that is to do the will of God. It was the joy of Jesus to do God's will. You know, Jesus didn't just suffer in this world. He did the will of God, and the will of God involved some suffering. The will of God was for Him to be a sacrifice in our place. You know, life isn't just happening and coming down upon us. Yes, I know that, that we live in a fallen world. Difficult things happen, and, and it's, a, it's a fallen world because Adam sinned. Yet, we also very well know in this church that, that everything passes through God's hands. He, he, he either sends things or He allows some things. I use the example a lot that He sent His disciples into the storm. And so, things aren't just happening. God's inspecting it, and we're being molded by God, and He is shaping us in all things. Jesus did the Father's will, and He had things to endure. And he had suffering to go through. He shed his blood. He substituted in our place. And again, this is the joy of the Lord. It was the joy of the Lord to sacrifice for us, knowing that we could be saved. For the joy that was set before him, What's that joy? He endured the cross. The result of the cross is joy to Jesus. Because the way of the cross leads home for all of us. We all, spiritually speaking, if you're here tonight and you've saved, you're saved, you've been to the cross. Where Jesus died, where He took our sins, right there. Oh, the mighty effects of the cross. There were effects of the cross when Jesus went to the cross. The, the sky turned dark. The rocks rent. Every natural rock has some kind of blemish in it on this earth even now. The effects of the cross. And there are effects of the cross in our lives. When we go to the cross, all of our sins are forgiven. We become a new creation in Christ. We're, we're not the same anymore. We're changed. Jesus endured the cross, and the results of the cross are His joy. Jesus was nailed to a tree, considering the satisfaction of God, the sufficiency which would bring about salvation to the entire world. If the whole world would come to Jesus, Jesus could save everybody. We need to see this is the joy of Jesus. Jesus says here in the verse, My joy, and now come I to thee, and these th things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So we see here that the Lord's joy becomes our joy. So, if what we've been sharing is the joy of the Lord, and, and this is a joy for you and I to have, well, in general, just, just scratching the surface, getting started for a few minutes as we're actually closing, it's a call to unselfishness for you and I to experience the joy of the Lord. We, we've, we've looked here and we've connected some things that show us that the joy of Jesus sprung up from His suffering in our place. 
Therefore, if we are to experience the joy of the Lord, it's going to come not by us being crucified on a cross. There, we couldn't do anything by being crucified on a cross. If I wanted to be crucified on the cross for you, it would do nothing for you. We're all sinners. By the way, everyone's sin debt has been paid. Jesus paid for everyone's sins. There's no more, there's no sin anybody could pay for, even if they wanted to. So for us to experience the joy of the Lord, it's not by us being crucified on a cross, but there's a call to unselfishness. There's a call to sacrifice on our part, not sacrifice on a cross. But how about when we bear one another's burdens? We're called to, we're called to sacrifice. We're called to help another. We're called to, to those in need. If we can assist another life and, and help someone else at the cost and expense of ourselves, then we're starting to have this experience we're talking about here of the Lord's joy. You know, rejoicing. I can't, I can't think of a, a greater rejoicing than we could do than in the salvation of souls. Only Jesus saves, but He's called us to a committed life as His disciple to share the message of the gospel with the world. To spend time with someone. That'll, that'll really interrupt and stop the natural flow of a day in this world. You know? But we're to rejoice in the salvation of souls. The Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Many, many souls were saved this summer. And it was an overwhelming experience of joy. How about for one soul? The angels rejoiced over one sinner that repenteth. Salvation is free. But joy, the experience of the Lord's joy, has a cost to it. As we've shared, joy is seen here as the result of sacrifice and suffering over another, to help another. For the sorrow and pain of another, nobody's going to disagree with this, for the sorrow and the pain of another, our response our right response is sympathy and a helping hand. Help another in a time of need, the Good Samaritan. We agree that's best. That's the proper reaction to a soul in need. Sympathy and a helping hand. And the result of that sympathy and a helping hand and the experience of the sacrifice of ourselves to help someone else, inconveniencing ourselves, if you will, the result of that is going to be joy in our lives. And that right there is, that ought to be enough to take us out of that, that, that lower section of pleasure, of of investing everything in pleasure. A time of pleasure, a moment of pleasure, an evening of pleasure, that's fine. But people in this world, they are, they are pleasure seeking. And that's it. You know, you, you want to go out for a moment of pleasure. And if you want to go out to some kind of public establishment, like a bowling alley or something, you're, man, you're really going to wait in line and the parking lot's going to be packed. Everybody is seeking pleasure.
that really shows us how low we're aiming. If we want pleasure, that, that just tops out at, at self-satisfaction. Then there's the next place of happiness we talked about. But then there's the overflowing joy of the Lord. Look, we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and seeing where joy comes from. Joy comes from helping one another. The secret source of joy has to do with our sacrifice for another. Jesus showed us. You know, God is not running His joy on sale at a reduced price. We talk about joy and and we talk about joy in an easy way so much. But I make that statement because of the preacher's story about knowing he has to get up and go to a store that ends in Mart on a Saturday morning. He's got to go. There's things he has to get. And he can't stand to go to any store that ends in Mart because of how busy it usually is. So he's got to go to Walmart on a Saturday morning. He's thinking about it on Friday night. So he gets up super early. And he heads down to the Walmart. And he pulls in the parking lot. And the parking lot's completely full. He's irritated as he can be before he gets out of his car. But he's already there. So he goes on in. And it's worse than he thought. He's wading through the people. And he goes and he grabs his few items and he tries to rush to the front and every line is a mile long in the store. And he's sitting there and he finally realizes, as his story goes, that that specific Walmart, for whatever reason, whatever unique situation it was, they were having a store-wide sale. And so the preacher standing there in line, of course, comes up with an analogy for it. And he's saying, everybody's coming in here to get what they want at a reduced price. And then he thought about God's people concerning the things of God. And and maybe God's people sometimes want to get things, the things of God, at a reduced price. They want the things of God to be on sale. If a church advertised the joy of the Lord for sale at a reduced price, I wonder, I wonder how packed the church would be with shoppers. How packed the parking lot would be to come to get this and that easy. And don't get me wrong, you, you know, we talk about the things of God are, are freely given. His grace is, is freely given. And, and don't mistake in me that we're not earning the joy of the Lord, but we're talking about a special place that the joy of the Lord is found for our lives. And that is in the place of sacrifice and serving someone else. Man, if there were... If the sale was low expectation and no expectation for joy, it would be standing room only in the church. But I guess if they came in and heard something like this, the parking lot would be just about empty. Yet, we look at the life of Jesus and we look at His joy that might be fulfilled in us. You know, and what is it? Is it just you and I being happy? I mean, I mean, we're happy that we know the Lord. We're joyful that we're saved. But we're talking about a specific experience of the fullness of the joy of the Lord. And it was, came from Jesus in sacrificing for us. His joy, that, that they might have my joy fulfilled and themselves. Like I said, we're not earning it, but it's found in serving another. I, I don't know if early this year has things uh, planned for 
a one another series. I didn't think about the one another series until I got to the end of these thoughts this week for this message. But, but let us be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And, and let us think about, you, you know, what are we doing to have the experience of the joy of the Lord? Well, we, you know, we come to church, we worship the Lord. We want to be, you know, we need to be in God's will. We could give a, a lot of different answers. But we see a great experience of the joy of the Lord A secret source of joy tonight in sacrificing for the sake of another. Bearing one another's burdens. Helping someone in a time of need. We connect things here tonight and we see a result of joy in our lives. That's how we're going to experience joy. It's going to have to be for, for someone else. We're going to have to look at someone else. We're going to have to be sensitive to someone else in a time of need. But as I say that, and, and as we close, I'm sure everyone here who's saved might, might remember the moment they were saved, the day they were saved, the month they were saved, and the joy that you had in newness of life In Jesus Christ. What a weight that is that's lifted. Knowing that the penalty of sin came upon the entire world. I mean, we look at God's Ten Commandments. You you share out in the world. And I know people don't know as much as they knew 40 years ago. They, they, They knew what salvation was. And many people today, you know, really don't. But but many people have some familiarity with the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Honor thy father and mother. Let me just stop right there. And, and everyone can realize. No one has done that perfectly. We look at God's commands. And that's God in written form. It's his perfection. He accepts nothing less than perfection. And that puts us all. Short of the glory of God. And that's the bad news. All, all liars, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not lie. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. That, that's bad news. But we don't have to leave it just at bad news because there's good news. Because Jesus Christ satisfied the perfection of God. He completely satisfied God in every way. There are many religious people in this world trying to do some good. But but if all of us were going to have a contest to jump from California to Hawaii, guess what? None of us are going to make it. We're all going to fall short. And that's everyone in the world by God's perfect standard. But His precious Son, His perfect Son, satisfied the perfect righteousness of God in our place. And that penalty being set for man, death, Jesus died that death. And He suffered in our place. And for anyone who realizes they're a sinner and that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, someone interrupted the preacher at a time like this one time and said, Jesus save me. And that's what it takes to trust in Jesus to save us from our sins. And He gives eternal life. And if there's anyone here tonight who does not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we we would love to share the Bible with you that you would trust Him as your Lord and Savior tonight. Or for anyone listening online that, that could call into the church and let us help them with the simplicity that there is in Jesus Christ who satisfied God's righteousness. He satisfied God's justice. And you will not be turned away if you will believe in Jesus to save you from your sins. Let us bow. Father in heaven, we do bow before you tonight. And Lord, we, we look at your life 
And we look at the joy that you made known to us. That is your joy. And Lord, to know that we can be partakers of your joy. Lord, it takes a, it takes a self-sacrificial love toward another. And the result of that is going to be your joy in our lives. And I, and I thank you for a full experience of your joy that we can have here. I thank you for the joyfulness of having our sins forgiven, knowing that we have a home in heaven, and having a personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which comes freely by grace through faith. And we pray for that one who may not know you tonight, that they would come forward and express their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that all the church can rejoice with them. And as for your people here tonight, Lord, I, I thank you for a portion of your word that gives us an understanding of, of the secret of the experience of your joy. And we pray these things tonight in Jesus' name. If everyone could please stand.